Hello everyone and welcome to the Concepts of Radiologic Science, RADS 201, our first step in our journey in radiologic physics. So in this PowerPoint we're going to uh, concentrate on the first uh, chapter that is in Bouchon uh, for this unit, then we'll also uh, cover a chapter in Carleton as well. So let's talk about, first of all, the nature of our surroundings. We need to talk about some very basic definitions when we talk about uh, physics. The first definition is matter. Okay, and matter is basically anything that occupies space and has mass. So let's think about that. Anything that occupies space and has mass. So you are matter. Uh, perhaps you're, you're drinking a, a bottle of pop right now. That's matter. Uh, the desk you're sitting at is matter, anything that occupies space and has mass. Well, next then, you might think, well, what is mass? Okay, uh, mass is the quantity of matter contained in any physical object. How much of it is there? When we talk about matter, uh, if we kept breaking something down, we broke it down and we kept breaking it down and breaking it down and breaking it down and breaking it down. Eventually, we would get to something that is called an atom. And an atom is the fundamental building blocks of all matter. So we've got matter, anything that occupies space and has mass, and mass then, the quantity of matter, how much matter is there in a physical object. There's another term, weight. And the term weight's generally used when describing the mass of an object. Okay, like for example, I might go to the store and I might buy uh, two pounds of apples, for example. You might get on the scale and uh, you weigh uh, 135 pounds. Okay, There's a big difference though. Weight is a force. Weight is a force exerted on a body under the influence of gravity. It is what is pulling us towards the center of the earth. How much of a force is pulling us towards the center of the earth? So weight is dependent on gravity. Remember, mass and weight are not the same. Mass is measured in kilograms. So when in the scientific world we talk about the mass of something, we're going to use the unit, the kilogram. Weight is measured using a unit called the Newton. So look at the big difference there. And when we go to the store, we buy two pounds of apples. Okay, now that's pounds. Okay, we're in the British system here in the United States. Uh, most of the world is in the uh, metric system. Uh, but we say we're buying two uh, pounds, uh, maybe a kilogram of something, okay? To a scientist, weight is measured using a unit called the Newton. And you might say, well, how am I going to remember that? Well, if you think about it, who came up with the idea of gravity? Well, that was uh, Newton, right? There's that story of Newton uh, sitting under the apple tree, an apple falls on his head, and he says, wow, why did that apple fall uh, on my head? Why didn't it go up into space as it fell? And he came up with what was called gravity, okay? Weight is dependent on gravity. Therefore, weight is named after the Newton. So let's take a look at this example. A student having a mass of 75 kilograms would weigh 735 newtons on the Earth, but would only weigh 120 newtons on the moon. Okay, so there's a difference in the weight. Uh, yeah, that would be great, you know, if you could lose weight without doing exercise, but unfortunately we can't do that usually, right? So what's the student's mass in outer space? Well, let's think about this. In outer space, there is no gravity. And what do we say weight is dependent on? Weight is dependent on gravity. So in outer space, the student doesn't weigh anything. They're, they're weightless, okay? Uh, what's the student's mass? Well, the mass, though, it, it uh, changed. So the mass doesn't change, the weight does change. Let's go on to talking a little bit about energy. Energy is the ability to do work. You're going to see this definition in any physics book, okay? Energy is the ability to do work. You've got more energy, you can do more work. 
And there are various uh, sources of energy. We've got what's called renewable energy, and we've got non-renewable energy. And the difference is, is that eventually, with non-renewable energy, it could eventually run out. Uh, there's only a certain, quanti a certain quantity of oil uh, that's in the earth, uh, coal, natural gas. But when we think about renewable energy, this is energy that's always going to be around. Like, you know, the sun's always going to be shining, the wind's always going to be blowing, right? Water's always going to be flowing. So this is renewable. So we've got non-renewable energy and renewable energy. Types of energy. So in the International System of Measurement, which is called the SI Systems or Systems International, energy is measured in what's called the joule. We've got potential energy. Potential energy is the ability to do work by virtue of position. And a good example of this would be a roller coaster sitting at the top of a hill. It's, it's not moving yet, but it's sitting there, and eventually what's it going to do? It's going to roll down the hill. Well, when it rolls down the hill, now we have a, a turning of that potential energy into what's called kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So roller coaster at top of hill potential, it begins to roll down, and we turn that potential energy into kinetic energy. We've got chemical energy. Chemical energy is the energy that's released by a chemical reaction. Okay, maybe you've taken uh, chemistry and you know that sometimes when you mix certain chemicals together, uh, the, the beaker can start to get hot, for example. Um, or um, hopefully this doesn't happen, but there could be a little bit of an explosion if you mixed chemicals together. So that's chemical energy. Electrical energy is the work that can be done when an electron moves through what's called an electric potential difference. Now we're going to uh, get into electrical energy a whole lot more in our second level of physics. We'll start talking about electricity at the end of this course, but much more about it in the, uh, in the next course, the next level. Thermal energy is the energy of motion at the atomic and molecular level, closely related to temperature. Now let's take a look at this, the energy of motion at the atomic or molecular level. As the molecules are, think about water, as they start to move, uh, and you're heating up a, a pan of water and they start to move more and more and more and more and faster and faster and faster until it eventually boils, okay, this is thermal energy. So it's closely related uh, to temperature. Nuclear energy. Energy contained in the nucleus of an atom. Now, atoms are very, 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 very tiny. However, the main part of the atom, the, the, it's called the nucleus of the atom, and we'll be talking about the atom much more. Inside of that nucleus is a lot of energy. Okay, a lot of energy. And if we split that atom, we break apart the nucleus, or we bring two atoms together, uh, splitting is called fission, uh, bringing together is called fusion. Uh, when we do that, we can make more energy, and, and this is called nuclear energy. Uh, a nuclear power plant is a great example. Now, this is nuclear energy that's in a controlled manner, or in an uncontrolled manner, uh, this is where we can have a nuclear bomb, for example. Uh, they Both of these kind of work on the same principle, but one is a controlled method, of, of making that nuclear energy, and the other is an uncontrolled method. Electromagnetic energy. This is going to be our main focus in this curriculum. Why? Because x-rays are a form of electromagnetic energy. Electromagnetic energy spans what's called a spectrum. And it goes all the way from cosmic rays and gamma rays, which are very, 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 very small wavelengths, up to radio waves, which have very, very, very long wavelengths. So really, what makes a radio wave different than an X-ray, different than a visible light ray? It all has to do with wavelength. 
So if we read on the slide here, it includes cosmic rays, gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet light, visible light, infrared light, radar, microwaves, TV, radio, cell phones, and all electronic transmission systems. Electromagnetic radiation is made up of electric and magnetic fields that move at right angles to each other. Very, very important. Plant this in your brain. Electromagnetic energy moves at the speed of light. So a radio wave moves at the speed of light. An x-ray moves at the speed of light. Uh, uh, the color orange, which is a form of uh, part of the visible light spectrum, it moves at the speed of light. Everything on the electromagnetic spectrum moves at the speed of light. Now, matter and energy are interchangeable, and this fact was first introduced by a famous physicist, Albert Einstein. When energy is emitted and it's transferred through space, we come up with a term called radiation. Energy emitted and transferred through space, radiation. Now, we create radiation uh, in an x-ray tube. Every time we take an x-ray, we have those electrons boiled off of the filament, hitting the anode. Uh, what are we going to make? We're going to make a whole lot of heat, a lot of thermal energy, but we're also going to make what are called x-rays, and x-rays are a part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So this is a good example of that interchangeability. You've got the uh, electrons being boiled off and then moving kinetic energy. Kinetic energy, uh, the electrons strike the anode, heat it up, thermal energy. Electrons strike the anode, creating x-rays, electromagnetic energy. So here we talk about this interchangeability of the energy. Ionizing radiation is any kind of radiation, very important, that's capable of removing an orbital electron from the atom with which it interacts. So if you look at this uh, little picture here, you've got an X-ray photon coming in. It is striking an electron. Now electrons revolve around the nucleus of the atom. And if that X-ray knocks that electron out of its orbit, we say that that atom has been ionized. And it's that ionization process that actually makes X-rays dangerous. Now, the orbital electron and the electron from which it was separated have a name, and those are called an ion pair. What types of radiation are ionizing? Well, certainly X-rays. X-rays can knock electrons out of their orbit, as can gamma rays, ultraviolet light, fast-moving particles such as alpha particles, and beta particles. Sources of ionizing radiation. Let's look at this pie chart. So we get ionizing radiation from different sources, from outer space, cosmic radiation, from the Earth itself, terrestrial radiation, internal radiation, consumer products, medical, and the biggest is radon. Radon is an invisible gas that seeps up from the Earth into our homes. If we our homes are not well ventilated, that radon gas can collect, and unfortunately, it can cause uh, cancer. So we worry about that, but radon is the biggest source of ionizing radiation. The discovery of x-rays. Let's just do a quick review. We've talked about this in other courses. Remember, the x-ray was discovered. It wasn't invented by Wilhelm Conrad Rankin. Uh, by accident. He wasn't looking for x-rays. He was doing another experiment, and then all of a sudden, something happened. So this all occurred on November 8th of 1895 at the University of Würzburg in Germany, and he was working with a Crookes tube. Uh, here's his uh, picture of his actual uh, laboratory. And the story goes there was a plate coated with barium platinum cyanide that began to glow whenever he turned on a tube in his lab that was covered with black paper. Well, it was kind of strange. He closed uh, you know, the windows, closed the shades. Whenever he uh, energized this Crookes tube that was covered, so nothing came out of it, no light or anything, a plate that was on the side wall in his laboratory began to glow. Uh, 
He knew that there must be something coming out of that tube, some kind of rays. He didn't know what they were, so he used the mathematical uh, term X. And this is how we get the term X-rays. Here's that famous picture, uh, first medical X-ray image of his wife's hand. Uh, you can see the ring on her hand. This was in 1896. 1901, Rankin received the first Nobel Prize in Physics. So that's, um, you know, that's noteworthy, the first Nobel Prize in Physics. Let's just read this quickly. On November 8, 1895, at the University of Würzburg, Wilhelm Rankin's attention was drawn to a glowing fluorescent screen on a nearby table. Rankin immediately determined that the fluorescence was caused by invisible rays originating from the partially evacuated glass Hidorf Crookes tube he was using to study cathode rays. Surprisingly, these mysterious rays they penetrated the opaque black paper wrapped around the tube. Rankin had discovered X-rays, a momentous event that instantly revolutionized the field of physics and medicine. However, prior to his first formal correspondence to the University Physical Medical Society, Rankin spent two months thoroughly investigating the properties of X-rays. And for his discovery, Rankin received the first Nobel Prize in Physics in 1901. It was the crowning achievement in a career beset by more than its share of difficulties. As a student in Holland, Rankin was expelled from the Utrecht Technical School for a prank committed by another student. Even after receiving a doctorate, his lack of a diploma initially prevented him from obtaining a position at the University of Würzburg. He was even accused of having stolen the discovery of x-rays by those who failed to observe them. Nevertheless, Rankin was a brilliant experimentalist who never sought honors or financial profit for his research. He rejected a, a title, von Rankin, that would have provided entry into the German nobility. And he donated the money he received from the Nobel Prize to his university. Rankin did accept the honorary degree of Doctor of Medicine offered to him by the medical uh, faculty of his own University of Würzburg. However, he refused to take out any patents in order that the world could freely benefit from his work. And at the time of his death, unfortunately, Rankin was nearly bankrupt from inflation that followed World War I. Well, we just read that he did a lot of studying of the x-rays and he came up with what are called the x-ray properties. And through the use of scientific method, Rankin found that x-rays are highly penetrating, invisible rays that are a form of electromagnetic radiation. They are electrically neutral and therefore you can't affect them by an electric or magnetic field. They're polyenergetic and heterogeneous, which means that uh, they've got many different energies. Remember when you set up 100 kVp on your control panel, that doesn't mean that every photon is 100 keV. In fact, there's only a few of them at that level. Most of them are very, very low energy. X-rays do release a small amount of heat when passing through matter, and I do emphasize small amount, a very minute amount of heat. Okay, It's not like you take an X-ray of a patient and they, you know, they can feel it. X-rays always travel in straight lines. They travel at the speed of light. They, as we saw, can ionize matter. They can cause the fluorescence of certain crystals, which means certain crystals will glow when they are struck by X-rays. This is what uh, film screen radiography was all about. The, the film was placed in a cassette. There were screens. When the x-rays hit the screens, they started to glow. And it was really the majority of light coming off of the screen that actually formed the radiographic image. Uh, Rankin uh, studied uh, these x-rays and he determined that they can't be focused by a lens. They do affect photographic paper. They can produce chemical and biologic changes in matter through ionization and excitation and they do produce secondary and scatter radiation. So these are the x-ray properties that Rankin came up with. The development of modern radiology. There are two general types of x-ray examinations. We've got radiography, which produces static or non-moving images, and then we've got fluoroscopy, which we say produces dynamic images, dynamic meaning moving. We can, we can see movement with fluoroscopy. 
An X-ray beam satisfactory for imaging requires thousands of volts of electricity. We call this kilovoltage. It's thousands, notice the difference, thousands of volts, thousands of an ampere of electricity. We call that a milliampere. Today, the hand can be imaged in milliseconds, thousands of a second, but in the early days of radiography, it often took several minutes to image the hand. Obviously, image blur due to motion was a huge problem in radiography's early days. Imaging times were shortened with the development of the intensifying screen and double emulsion radiography. We call that film screen. The fluoroscope. The fluoroscope was developed in 1898 by the American inventor Thomas Elva Edison, and he eventually stopped his work in radiology after his assistant Clarence Daly became the first X-ray fatality in the United States. A little bit of uh, history, other radiography inventions. The book talks about collimation and filtration, usually credited with being introduced by a Boston dentist, William Rollins, before the turn of the 20th century. Something called the interrupterless transformer, which really took uh, radiography to the next level and made the machines, I'm putting in quotes, more powerful. Uh, this was created in 1907 by H.C. Snook. The hot cathode x-ray tube, uh, created in 1913 by Will William D. Coolidge. 1960s uh, ultrasound came about, 1970s CT and PET scanning came about, and then in the 1980s MRI. Reports of radiation injury. In 1904 was the first x-ray fatality in the United States, so we started to learn that x-rays are dangerous and we need to be very careful when we work with them. In 1910, biologic effects of x-rays began to be investigated. Years later, it was discovered that overexposure to x-radiation could lead to blood disorders, which included aplastic anemia, leukemia. However, today we know low doses may result in a small incidence of latent harmful effects. That's why we are always very careful still when we work with x-rays. And we know that it is a well-established fact that the fetus is most sensitive to the effects of radiation exposure within the first trimester. Very, very important. That's usually a question on the registry. Uh, fetus most sensitive during that first trimester. That's when something called organogenesis is occurring. All of the organs are forming. And uh, something we learned from radiobiologist Virginie and Tribendo that the faster that cells multiply, the more sensitive they are to radiation. So think about a developing fetus. It, it's you know developing, the organs are forming, everything's happened very quickly, and therefore it is very sensitive to the effects of radiation. Although effective radiation safety practices make for a safe working environment today, never become complacent when working with radiation. What does that mean? It means, you know, we can't see it, we can't taste it, we can't smell it. Therefore, we're like, ah, oh, you know, it's not, not like I'm going to get x-rayed uh, tomorrow and it's going to kill me, okay? However, you know, radiation is dangerous. It's ionizing. We got to be careful. And although it may, uh, you know, with the low doses we use, it's not going to kill you tomorrow, uh, you may have some effects, you know, 30 years from now if you're not careful and you get over-radiated. So because of this, we always want to practice what's called a LARA, as low as reasonably achievable. And we always want to utilize the principle, cardinal principles of radiation protection, time, distance, and shielding. Time, distance, and shielding. Primary radiation protection devices, we've got filtration, which removes low energy photons from the beam. Collimation, which limits the radiation field. Intensifying screens, which allow for a decreased exposure. Protective apparel, like leaded gloves, uh, aprons. Uh, we use gonadal shields for our patients to protect the reproductive organs. And we use various protective barriers, like our control booth, for example. When we take an x-ray, we always are behind uh, and in the control booth. Very, very important, except for screening mammography, examination of asymptomatic patients, patients that don't have any symptoms, 
examinations of asymptomatic patients is not indicated. Okay. Years ago, uh, you might go in for uh, an annual physical, and the doctor uh, years ago might say, you know what, okay, great, you're, you're looking good, or your lungs sound good, but you know what, let's get an x-ray of your chest just to make sure uh, nothing's going on. Okay. That's not done today. Okay. However, it was a common practice years ago. Today, the thinking that all doctors should have when ordering x-rays is that the benefits of any radiologic procedure must always outweigh the risks. The benefits of any radiologic procedure must always outweigh the risks. Uh, in your book, uh, box 1-1, uh, uh, it's called the Ten Commandments of Radiation Protection. Make sure you look those over. And box 1-2 is a task inventory for radiography as required for examination by the American Registry of Radiologic Technologists. So make sure you look over that task inventory. Okay, very important. And just uh, an interesting uh, picture here of some early fluoroscopy. You notice the tube behind the boy. Doctor sitting in front, there's a screen. The x-rays go through the boy, strike the screen, make it glow, and the doctor's there to look at it. Notice there's no radiation protection here for the operator of the equipment, for the doctor, uh, or for the patient. Okay, so a very interesting picture from 1912.